But what we bring to the table, to me, a very compelling cultural perspective. It acknowledges that substance is enduring and that form is ephemeral and knowing the difference. Achieving a balance between the wisdom of the past and the knowledge of the future with the director of a program at the University of Hawaii Scheidler College of Business at Manoa, Dr. Philo Tusi Avengalio. Next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha mai kako and welcome to Long Story Short. I'm Leslie Wilcox. With a foot in both Western and Pacific Island cultures, our guest has been recognized nationally in economic business development. He is Dr. Philao Tusi Avengalio, better known as Dr. Tusi at the UH Scheidler College of Business. He runs the Pacific Business Center program within the college. Descended from a long line of Samoan chiefs, Dr. Tusi was raised in the coastal village of Leone in American Samoa in a family that included six other siblings. His father served in the U.S. Navy and ran a successful agricultural business. His mother was a cultural practitioner who devoted her time to serving family members and supervising the family plantation during his father's military assignments. After graduating from high school, Dr. Tusi, following the family tradition of military service, was on his way to the Marine Recruitment Office to enlist along with four friends. But a twist of fate intervened. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, it was the same day that the newspapers published uh, the list of scholarship students. So my name, starting with an A, Aveng Alio, was the first on the list. So my aunt brought it to my father's attention. Uh, the family was absolutely sure I must be the smartest kid on the island because I was the <laughs> first on the list. They actually caught me just before I entered the recruiting office. How interesting how a life can change on yeah. timing. So he grabbed my hand and I, for the first time, I was almost disobedient. But you know, when you, when you got a big father with a big hand, you uh, give it a second thought and was obedient, so. And he wanted you to go into education? Wanted to go to school, college. Which became your livelihood, yes. your profession. That's right. Two weeks later, uh, my dad went with me. Went to Hawaii uh, to meet family there and then he saw me off in San Francisco. So I was on the same flight as the other four. Uh, they went on to Vietnam and I went to Kansas. Kansas State Teachers College in Emporia, Kansas. Our Commissioner of Education of the Department of Interior at that time felt that small Midwestern schools would best be for acculturation purposes for, for students from the islands and I, I, I'm glad I went there. So strong family values, but still culture shock. Uh, extreme culture shock especially with winter. But family values were very much the same. In fact, uh, I've sort of been developed a tongue-in-cheek uh, um, book called Coming of Age in Kansas. And it's just basically the cultural adjustments that coming from a, a tropical sea coastal village uh, right into the middle of the Midwest and interacting and working with people there. Uh, what amazed me was that many of the young Kansas boys had never been to Kansas City or had never flown in an airplane. So they had their own kind of insularity, their own kind of island. So we actually had a lot in common and we certainly had a lot of fun. So they, they welcomed you and, and you embraced them too? Well, they didn't welcome me at first. They didn't know what, they didn't what, know to make what I you. was. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the usual, uh, he's too big to be a Mexican or, or an Indian, American Indian. You know, he's too light skinned. Uh, to be black, so they figured I might be one of them light-skinned Negroes or something of that nature. So uh, it was fun trying to get to know them and they get to know me. And it usually comes around by playing music, I'm playing the guitar. <laughs> Little cultural things that eventually got their curiosity to the point that uh, it laid the foundation to some very enduring relationships. Enduring as in marriage. Yep, marriage and friendships. I married a young gal from uh, Emporia, Kansas. She had no idea what American Samoa was, but I think what really helped made the transition to Kansas were the Hawaiians, the Hawaiian students that were there. They, more than any, anything else, helped me to transition uh, successfully because they already had networks. 
They had relationships and uh, they were extremely popular. And so I was very fortunate that um, they sort of took me under their wing and the rest is history. And you never once considered leaving, saying, ah, oh, this is so different from what I'm used to. No, because again, be, uh, being part of a collective culture, um, I, think, uh, I think the shame would be unbearable. You represented your community. Yeah, yeah because it wasn't just me that, that left. But didn't your community want you to marry a local girl from your village? Oh yeah, well that came later. I was already gone and uh, it's, it's a lot easier to make a decision when you're like 7,000 miles away from the village. How did that go over in Leone? It didn't go over as well as I thought. My grandmother was very concerned that my wife was so skinny and she was fearful that her health uh, would not uh, allow her to bear as many children as, as she would, grandchildren as she would like to see. But uh, I think in time, Linda became uh, a very endearing part of the family to the point where when we'd go anywhere, uh, the first thing they asked for is, well, where's Linda? <laughs> you know, and, and I said, hello, oh, where's your wife? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so, so in many ways, um, uh, going to Samoa enriched her life, and her life enriched my family's life and my people's, uh, those that she had the occasion to interact with. So the, the people who decided about the match between a Samoan culture and the Midwestern Kansas setting were right. Ah, uh, yes, in ways, yeah, yeah. And then what also helped was that my dad, having uh, served in the military, um, was able to keep the family uh, and, and traditions uh, at a distance to, to allow his son to make a decision. Uh, Dad knew me so well and he was able to see without having to ask me uh, where I wanted to go in this situation. And I think my mom attuned to me also, so they both, without having to sit down and, and draw it out, uh, felt and sensed where my heart was, and knowing my heart better than most, uh, they just supported. Philo Tusi of Engalio, or Tusi, returned to Leone in American Samoa to teach at a local high school while considering a career in law. With most of their teachers trained locally, the students were excited by the accomplishments of this native son who had returned home with a college degree. Finding his true calling, Tusi went on to pursue his education in Missouri and Utah, earning master's and doctorate degrees in educational administration. After earning his PhD, he proudly returned home. Sitting together under a breadfruit tree, his mother asked him to explain why he thought it was such a great achievement. And I was thinking that this is too much, too complex, et cetera, for, for my mother to understand. And uh, I sadly also included the thought that she only had a second, you know, two years of education in elementary school, thoroughly confusing the difference between knowledge and wisdom. I shared with her a lot, because I love theory, so much of my emphasis was on looking at the theory of, uh, by giants in the field, uh, Mintzberg, Hertzberg, Ardress, uh, Hersey Blanchard, uh, and political people like Montesquieu, Locke, and looking at organization, etc. She sort of just uh, absorbed, let to listen quietly, and then she told me to go feed the pigs. So I, I was thinking, feed the pigs? I mean, that, that's what I used to do when I was a kid, you know. Meanwhile, thinking to myself, wow, the great value of my doctorate degree is, is no higher than feeding pigs. And a uh, um, little miffed I've, as I left. But then when I returned, my mom then asked me uh, questions that, that thoroughly put me in my place and, and, and forever endeared me to appreciating uh, wisdom. Uh, she asked me if if all the books that these men wrote were to, to be put in a, in, a, in a large basket, how large the basket would be? And I said, it'd probably be as large as the village. <laughs> and I was thinking, where is this going? And uh, a, a tawanga is um, a fibrous uh, 
mesh that you we pull from uh, the halakonia stem, and we use that to, uh, to squeeze uh, grated coconut so we get the milk out of it. So she said, if we got a tawanga and you squeeze all these books, in, what would you get? Privately, I was thinking a lot of ink, <laughs> but I really didn't know where she was going, so I said, I, I don't know. And she says, uh, this is what you get. You get uh, respect, uh, consideration, dignity, uh, sensitivity, and compassion, uh, the very things that are needed to make men do the kinds of things that need to be done, especially if you're a leader. And I was thinking, damn, she just encapsulated. Essentially, all the theories said the same thing, is to treat a human being humanely. Followership uh, is, and, and leadership can become that much more effective. And then if you take those words and you squeeze them in the Taiwan again, uh, what do you get? And I said, um, then she really got me there, and I said, I don't know. And she said, you get alofa. And alofa means, uh, in our language, love. And then she said, how strange that you should go so far away to a place at great expense to learn how to alofa. You could have learned that here at home, in your family and among the village. She was just reminding me that um, don't be so full of yourself. <laughs> Throughout her life, the mother of Philo Tusi Avengalio gently imparted to her children the values of the elders, their alofa, and hopes for the future. Dr. Tusi's work honors his mother's vision that he would one day play a role in enhancing the quality of life for those in the Pacific region. As the director of the University of Hawaii's Pacific Business Center program, he consults with and coordinates assistance to organizations that have business and economic development projects in the area. The center's staff provides the technical assistance. Dr. Tusi's key role is bridging traditional values and Western thought. But what we bring to the table, to me, a very compelling cultural perspective. It acknowledges that substance is enduring and that form is ephemeral and knowing the difference. That by preserving the substance of the past and then clothing it with the forms of the future, we would be able to achieve an enduring a balance between the wisdom of the past and the knowledge of the future. My technical staff are very good in the areas of fiscal management, accounting, um, marketing, um, financing. What I bring to the table are the social, cultural, and the historical, and the spiritual ones. It's weaving these things, two things together. My approach in the Pacific is very different from a person that might be approaching from uh, a corporate business or a business from mainland or from Europe. I think Bank of Hawaii might be the, the best example just recently. Uh, when American Samoa was hoping to get um, at least 12 months transition period versus Bank of Hawaii wanting to withdraw within 30 days or 90 days. When a meeting was held at the last minute, the discussions initiated from the Samoa delegation uh, dealt with issues of uh, commonalities, common history, family, ancestors, wisdoms, things of that nature. and. Reminders that, that even though we may be separate on the surface, that we are all connected in the deep. Now, I can imagine the Bank of Hawaii strategic uh, a consultant freaking out and says, what does this have to do with assets and you know projected uh, profits, et cetera, the things that are more business associated? But fortunately, the leader, CEO uh, Peter Ho, as a boy grew up here, was born here, and it resonated. It resonated at that depth. They had a, a reach an agreement that uh, uh, 12 months might be something that the Bank of Hawaii can, can certainly accommodate and, and it would reconsider its original position. All the lawyers in the world could not have done what occurred there. And again, it's bringing that social, cultural, and spiritual side 
and then weaving it with the, the technical and the, and, and the knowledge side to arrive at, at a place where there can be some mutual understanding, basic human decency and consideration. And, uh, and I think it, it, it has worked out then, and I think it will continue to work into the future. So in a sense, you, you find partners and ways to get people moving together to enhance mutual lives. How, you know, it's, it's so tough to pick business, personal partners, business partners. How do you do that? How do you identify? We have a term called iike. In Hawaiian, it's called ike. It's, it means attunement, sensing. And that can only come about from, from experience, from maturity, and learning and, and living wisdoms uh, over a period of time. So I lead with my senses, which is really peculiar because my more quantitatively oriented colleagues are wondering, what are you talking about? But we always get there. And I need to be able to sit down with the various leaders, whoever they are, and sense them. Our ancestors used EEK to navigate so they can sense not only the, the wind, the wave, the winds and the stars, but they can also feel. And I think that what's, is what enabled them to achieve their destinations. And in a very small, humble way, it, it, I was able to tap into that to help me to achieve what goals that we were able to for our purposes. Tapping into the wisdom of the ages did not come easily to Dr. Philautusi Avingalio. With the distractions of youth and exposure to many philosophies and models, he says it's taken a long time. Today, his life perspectives are well-developed, and they begin with the belief that his ancestors have always held, that people and the universe are family. We have two mothers. Uh, there's the birth mother, and there's your earth mother. And in Polynesia, in Samoa, it's called Papa. Papa is the name of the earth mother. The burying of the, the afterbirth in a tea leaf, and the tea leaf uh, is a very spiritual plan, metaphorically symbolizes the connection of your umbilical cord to the earth. So my birth mother and there's my earth mother. And there's also your father, your human father, which is my dad, and Tangaloa Langi, which is the universe, the stars and the heavens. When you have this sense of awareness of who your parents are, that gives you a sense of wholeness that you wouldn't have without it. What it also means is that the offspring of both your mothers and your fathers are your siblings. They're your, your kin. If the earth and the heavens are the parents of all living things, and they're also my parents, that means all living things and inanimate, stones, rocks, etc., are my relatives. So uh, that really didn't bear fruit in terms of, of, of its meaning until I was in college. One of my student friends' uh, family owned a large ranch, but they were clearing some land with uh, huge trees, and they had this this uh, tractor knocking down the trees. And in fact, I couldn't even stay; I could watch. But I've been having those kind of feelings every time I see these kinds of things, and then uh, it sort of all came together. You know, it's like watching your your kin being slaughtered or abused. The basis of nature is God. They're one and the same thing. You can't separate the two, and, and it's this separation thing that, that I had a real difficult time trying to reconcile. What, what made a big difference for me is when I sat in on a lecture uh, about Howard Gardner. Howard Gardner did uh, these, these studies on human intelligence. What he pointed out is that there's more than one intelligence. You know, before it, was, it just used to be either your IQ, and that had to be with problem solving and quantitative thinking through mathematics, that uh, there are other intelligences, and the one that just jumped out at me was attunement. It was an intelligence. Uh, people had an ability to sense and feel what is not readily apparent to others. And then this quantum mechanics thing comes out with physics, that all things emanate 
rhythms or energies and that there are animals and, and, and humans, they can sense these. And I said, ah, that's what my grandfather meant was we talk to the trees. He didn't mean talk, literally talk to the trees. He meant if you're a healthy tree, you would emanate a different energy than if you were a sick tree or if you're young or inappropriate. So many of these kinds of, of attributes can actually now be validated or at least reaffirmed with modern science. So, How do you develop attunement? We develop it only if we focus on it. But we don't focus on it because we have technology that does it for us. Let, let me give you an example. A, a, a mother has a child. The child is a block away and falls off the stairs. Mama knows something happened to baby. She said, oh, you know, and then uh, there are many instances where people say, how did you know? Well, I just knew something was wrong. Um, another more common example, you've been to, ever visited a place where, where it just felt really foreboding? <laughs> and then you go to another place and nobody's there, but it felt so warm and, 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 and inviting. An example for that for me is, is the church in Leone. When I go into that church, I have an incredible feeling of embrace. I now know why, but at the time I didn't know. In the late 1800s, churches were built by crushing coral into lime and then making a sort of a cement, but there were no rebar, they used stones. But they ran out of stones when the, uh, the walls were sort of halfway up, gathered them from the river and the streams. and. And so the only stones uh, left were on what we call kia. Kias are like the heiaus where ali'i are buried. So Leone, if you go to that village, is noteworthy in the sense it has no kias. So a very agonizing decision um, and, and a testimony to their faith had to be made. So all the chiefs of the clans gathered and the proposition was suggested that we have no stones, and the only stones remaining are the stones on the kia of each of our families. And these are our ancestors. The, these are the giants of our, of our history in the past. So each clan, uh, I think, very emotionally made a decision that uh, they're going to build, finish the church. And so each one brought their stones and completed the walls that, that now hold up the church. That explained to me why I felt the way I did, because the kias of my um, uh, Ali'i ancestors are on the walls of, these, of, 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 the, of this building. Do your cultural values get in the way of your job at all? If you only have a foot in one world, reconciling dilemmas may be an impossible thing, but having a foot in both worlds, I can um, move back and forth very comfortably in both of these worlds. I'm a firm believer that trust begins with looking in another person's eyes and feeling them, sensing them, observing their behavior. It has been a traditional practice of our traditional leaders. We sit and we look at each other and we share food and drink. Uh, sharing food and drink is so essential to sharing oneself. And you take it even further when you can invite them to your home. It's important for me to have them feel that I am comfortable, that they are welcome to meet my grandchildren, my children, and my wife and others in the family. But see how disarming it could be. When I can move them into my world, then I think I'm in a position where I can enhance a, a trusting relationship. In our traditional settings, before we engage or receive visiting um, dignitaries or, or, or chiefs from other villages, they do their homework. They check your genealogy and your history so that when the engagement actually occurs, there's a context in which pathways can then be extended out. And, you know, multiple pathways enables the guest to find which is the most comfortable to walk on. 
Once that one is identified, the others all collapse into that one. And then we receive them that way. Dr. Tusi says he's thankful for the collective guidance, wisdom, and sacrifices of his parents and extended family in his voyage through life. It's now his turn and obligation to impart those specific lessons and his Western educational experience to be there for his four children and seven grandchildren as they navigate toward the future. Thank you, Dr. Philo Tusi of Ingalio, Dr. Tusi, Director of the University of Hawaii's Pacific Business Center, for sharing your long story short. And thank you for watching and supporting PBS Hawaii. I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahui ho, till next time. Aloha. For audio and written transcripts of this program and all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. Our people, uh, we think in metaphors and we, and we learn through stories. And because we're a navigator of people, most of our wisdoms come derived from the ocean. When the winds don't shift, adjust your sails. My favorite metaphor is the one that deals with challenges. And it's about being bold, being courageous, being entrepreneurial. Only you can sense when it's time to turn into the wind and reach for shores yet untouched. When is your time? When do you turn into the wind? When do you adjust your sail? Like my mom said, anybody can hoist an anchor and unfurl a sail. You know how to do that, but it's knowing when to do it, and more important, why do you do it?